indeed the topic is uh, neural networks in EPL, and it's joint work with uh, Sven Lo Scholz and Bob Lackey. So, uh, very much following up the previous talk, let me tell my view on the neural network story. Um, surely we all read newspapers, and uh, neural network networks is a big thing. Uh, they're popular, they are trend. Um, and the, the, the nice thing about them is that they do have practical applications. So they solve problems practically by image recognition, pattern matching, and so forth, where analytical algorithms are either very complex or do not uh, fit. So the way we are supposed to implement them nowadays um, is not that satisfying in my opinion. So basically, the, the, the big push comes from the large companies like Google, Facebook, and, and uh, Microsoft to use what is called machine learning frameworks. Examples of these are TensorFlow, PyTorch, CNTK, and so forth. Um, if you're a data scientist who's interested only in uh, standard machine learning algorithms, which most of the data scientists do, then there's no problem. Everything works perfectly, it's, it's optimized, it's well designed. If you are a student who is trying to extend the framework to add an operation that's not there in some non-trivial form, or you want to optimize the network for a specific hardware, then right away you're in a big trouble. You're in a big trouble because uh, the size of these networks is really large. Right? And when I tell you, really, it's millions of lines of codes, it is a layered design, you have a Python sitting on top and a bunch of libraries sitting in the uh, uh, and the sites, and you have some core C++ thing that tries to build data for graphs. So it's, it's, it's a huge mess. It's really difficult to get there, and it means that most people won't. Right? Now, if we look closely, if we look closely enough at what actually is happening at this uh, at the level of these networks, we'll learn, we'll figure out that most of the operations that uh, uh, are required are operations on multidimensional arrays. Nothing else. It's a lot of linear algebra, tensor operations, convolutions, some normal uh, uh, array shifting around and you know, array things. Right? So, as I'm presenting on the array conference and I talk about neural networks, you can guess what my next slide is going to be. So, the idea is to explore how difficult it would be to create something like a shallowly embedded DSL or a library in the uh, array language, in, in an array language. The language doesn't really matter. So it seems that we have all the abstractions necessarily. We know how to do high performance. We know how to do nice compositional array programs. So the question is really, uh, is it doable? How difficult it is? And how well would it perform? And the thing is that nobody, it seems, have, have tried to do it for real. So in this paper that we present here, uh, that we submitted to this workshop, we start the investigation from looking into a very standard problem, it's like you know, a tutorial of machine learning, um, uh, a handwritten digit recognition problem with a well-defined input data and output data, uh, and we use APL as an array language to try this out. Right? And basically in, in, the, in the rest of the talk, uh, I'll uh, 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 share my impressions regarding uh, these three questions. Um, we'll look a bit into runtime performance uh, and a bit of a structure of the network structure of the problem and uh, uh, we'll try to figure out whether something is fundamentally missing from the current uh, picture from what is currently available uh, on the market. So the answer to these first two questions is both very positive and they are summarized in this slide. So it turns out that if we, if we use APL this is roughly all you need to write, I mean from the, from the perspective of the built-in operators that, that you, you want to get from the framework, in order to implement this handwritten recognition problem. Right? So, this, this means that the problem that we're actually looking at is very simple, it is, is simple. Right? It's not much stuff that is happening there, and machine learning well, and, and the neural networks are not something very magical. Actually, it's something rather simple. And in order to give you an idea why I think that the array language is, is a very nice level of abstraction for this particular problem, I'm going to just uh, 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 do a live demo and implement a few of these operators to give you a feel for what is happening. Um, so, let me first, so let me first describe the problem. So that's the schematic uh, view of the algorithm. So 
of the one half of the algorithm. So this is a particular implementation of this problem. Um, it's called the Zhang's design. It's also a very standard thing that a lot of papers cite. Uh, you can do it differently, but conceptually, if this is this is what it is. Um, so we start. Oops. So we start from from the image on the left hand side. It's called I. Uh, we go through a bunch of layers, and we end up with a ten element vector. And this vector contains probabilities of having um, digits that corresponds to the index um, uh, uh, being on that image. So for the probability of index 0 uh, corresponds to the probability whether the image is 0, one, if the image is 1, and so forth. So the way we do this is we push this image through a bunch of layers, and we have three types of layers. Uh, we have a, uh, we compute a, a, a convolution. Uh, we do a, what is called the average pooling, um, and we do a, what is called a fully connected layer. So, um, yeah, the, the, the basic underlying uh, principle of all the neural networks is that we have parameters and forms of weights, and then we do linear operations on the input data, and we compose them together, and those weights actually determine how we get from the input to the output. So in, in, in the current example, the weights, the parameters, the input parameters that we would need to assume that are given in this case are these convolution kernels that we have here um, um, and here and here. Right? So these things determine uh, how the, the, the transformations need to go. So first we, we go from, from the, the original image and we apply uh, convolution. We, we compute six convolutions uh, with a with a weights of size five by five. We add some uh, bias. It's just a, a, a one uh, uh, number, and we apply what is called an activation function. So this function to normalize the elements and make the the, the back uh, computation easier. Um, so then we have six uh, let's call them images here. Uh, then we do uh, an average pooling step, which basically just reduces the size of the array. So we have an array of 24 by 24, and then we split this into groups of 2 two by 2s, and we average each group. So there we get to the uh, arrays of 12 by 12. And then we compute the convolutions, but this time we do it a bit differently. We do not uh, compute it on, on the individual image as, but we compute it on the entire stack of these assets. We also add the bias, again apply the, this activation function, do the average pooling again, arrive to, uh, to get uh, four, by four vectors, merge them together, and we do the fully connected layer. And the fully connected layer is nothing but a series of dot products with the weights that are uh, of the same shape, of the same size as the input vector. Right? So let me, let me just... Uh, then do a few of these in APL to demonstrate that it's actually doable. So let's do let's do first the uh, simple function uh, that is called logistic, uh, and we do it like this. So this is e to the power of two. This is e to the power of minus two. This is one plus e to the power of minus two, and this is one. Oops. This is 1 divided by the 1 to the power of 2. It's right associative, so I don't need to put parentheses around. That's the same thing. And then I can abstract it away into the function. It's going to look like this. Minus. And then I need to replace it with a uh, parameter omega, and then I can do thing and it computes exactly the same. So that's that's easy. The nice thing about this definition is that it's automatically shaped and rank polymorphic. Right? This means that I can apply this immediately to the arrays of any shapes and ranks. And what it does, what it does, it lifts the function application at the level of individual scale and elements. So I need to write anything extra, so this function is immediately ready to be applicable in these positions where we have this activation function happen. Um, the, the, next thing, <coughs> the next thing that we want to 
look at as is a convolution. And let us look at the one arrow here. So we're going to just take an, array, an, an image, two-dimensional image, and uh, a two-dimensional uh, array of weights. And we're going to implement the function uh, in the APL style, and the rule of thumb uh, in the good APL implementation that it should use as little indexing as possible. Because, well, uh, it is, indexing is error-prone, you can do some of by one errors and so forth. Um, APL runs better if you don't do indexing, because it, it, it's an interpreter and it's optimized for uh, large operations on the entire arrays. And usually if you do this, this way, you get more generic functions that are applicable to wider range of things. So, let us start with two images, uh, with, sorry, with, with two input arrays, i and k. So, it's, it's a 5 by 5 array i, and it's a 2 by 2 array k. Uh, I, I reduced the, the size a bit, but the, the size doesn't matter. The, it matters that they are two-dimensional, and the, the uh, actual values don't matter as well. Um, so, if we think about how we implement this in C or Fortran, then basically we take this array k and we slide this over the array i, and then we do, when we go to the, to the particular uh, element, we would first multiply the neighborhood with the weights, and then we'd sum them up. And then we'd go to the next element. Now, the, the key idea behind the, the uh, eight element version that I'm about to demonstrate is that we can shift the additions and multiplications. We can do first all the multiplications, and then we can add that. Right? So, roughly saying that if we have, if we have intermediate results like this, um, then we can just simply add them together like that. So this is this folds the plus across the these arrays, and we get the, the sum. Okay? So, uh, but we also need to multiply them. So let's first let's first uh, figure out how to multiply these sum arrays with the particular weights. We have we have k that is two, two by two. So let's create a two by two array that's going to contain the the i's. So and that's going to be done like this. So we can go and have oops, we can have k and then we can go for l, l element i. And that's going to generate us a 2 by 2 array where every element contains the entire array back. Okay? Um, this means that we can immediately multiply this k by the weights, and it's going to distribute the multiplication of elements in k to every array i. So in principle, now we're almost ready to sum everything together. But the problem is that we didn't do, if we sum, if we, if we would sum them up right now, they wouldn't come to the convolution that we are computing, right? So we need to do some shifts in order so that they align correctly. The question is, where do we get the offsets that we need to shift these arrays around? And it turns out, and this is, this is one APL specific thing, that if we do this, uh, we're going to get an array of the same shape as K, but they're going to contain as elements the indices that the elements of k have, right? So if we're going to go to back to our definition and we're going to replace k with i rho k, it's going to be exactly the same, but now if we're going to look at the individual element that this math function gets, we're going to see that, oops, no, uh, let, me, let me get rid of the multiplication, this. Uh -huh. So now we see that magically um, this, uh, this index, it corresponds to the amount of rows and columns that we need to throw away in order to get to the actual original shift. Right? So all we then need to do, uh, we need to say that we throw away that many elements from i, right, and we get we get we, we align these these subplanes to the right positions. Uh, we would almost want to write this to, mark, to to sum them together, but it doesn't work because if we look at the underlying, we'll see that they are of different shapes. Right? So we can align this. We can solve this by just formalizing the shape. In this case, it's going to be four by four, and then we can add uh, multiplication by k, and then. This, and then we need to disclose them like that. 
and that we're going to get the array that we are after. Oops. So that's we're going to get our image, uh, our convolution. Now, the one thing that I'd like to fix, so the one thing that is too specific is this 4x4. Four four. It doesn't have to be fixed to any consoles. We can compute this straight away, and this is basically going to be just the shape difference. Uh, so it's, it's the difference of the shape of the big image and the small number of weights. So you see it's exactly the same result. And now we can abstract this immediately to the function. Like this, we just need to bind the parameters correctly. So let's say that i is going to go from the i is going to go from the left statement separator. K is going to be taken from the right statement separator, and then we should be done. This. So if I do i from k, then I get my convolution. Okay. Again, the nice thing about this specification is that it's completely random shape polymorphic. We can apply to the array of any shapes and size given that the, uh, the rank of i and k are the same. Right? So, for instance, we can do something like this. Right? So, it's a very sophisticated way to write multiplication, but it works on scalars. Scalars are also an array of uh, zero dimension, so that, that's perfect. Right? And we can also write it like this. So uh, we can do convolution with the array of the same shape, we're going to just get one scalar, and it's exactly the same as writing this, right? So it's a dot product. It's a dot product that we get automatically from the convolution. Now, if we use this function, we use this function, then let's uh, see how it can be applied in order to get the entire layer. So we're not, we, we, we just implemented now one arrow, so how can we do a bunch of them? Well, a bunch of them we can do by stacking those weights together in an array of larger dimensions. So, uh, instead of having k that is this, we can have a, uh, we can have a k that is that. And let me show you that the row of the shape of k is 6 by 2 by 2. So we have 6 weights stacked together on the inner dimension. Now, um, what we want to do now is we almost would like to apply, we also would like to apply i, I count k, but it doesn't work well because obviously they are in different shapes. So we will now want to fix this by doing this. And we want to use this funny rank operation that is going to be done like this. Oops, let me pass this too much numbers. Let me just compute uh, the shape out of this. So, this. So what I wrote here is the following. So I'm saying that uh, we are applying everything from the array k, but we're not taking scalar elements, but we are taking the two-dimensional elements. So we're indexing not at the level of scalars, but we're indexing until we hit two dimensions. Right? And this is, is, this is exactly what we do, except the, the, the biases. So if we want to do the, the biases, we need to do a bit more work. So let me show you. So that is my array of biases. Um, so as you can see that here we have biases that are just, well, it's, it's individual scalar for, for, for every convolution here. So um, um, uh, what we need to do in order to add this together, we're going to say it like this. We're going to make this function into a two-argument function, and then we're going to apply this Rank operator like that. Okay. So what I'm what I'm saying here is that we're going to have we're going to have a, an array b that counts as a left argument. Then we're going to have this expression which adds every number from the array b to i conf omega. And we're going to take two-dimensional arrays from the right-hand side argument and zero-dimensional arrays from the left-hand side argument. Right. In that case, it, it all works out. And the last thing is that, uh, well, we don't need to be specific about two because this is this can be uh, this can be generalized. And basically, all it is it's just the rank. Oops, that's just the rank of i. Again, sorry, it's too large font, so I'll stick the row here. And we can abstract this immediately to the uh, to the other function that is called mcom, and we need to get. Say this to it like this, it's going to get from the R argument, statement separator, and the end of the function, and then if we can do n on i k b, we should write the same result. The nice thing is that this m conf can be immediately applied to our old case, and this is exactly as doing i conf k. 
So this is this this mconf is the most generic convolution that we have for doing multiple things at the same time. And if you look carefully here, it turns out that this mconf is good enough to do all the convolutions layer here, including fully connected layer. Right? So this is it's pretty obvious. So we started from here. Now, if you look here, then if this is an input argument that comes as one object, so you have six S's that is your one object. Now, try to look at here and merge all these S's as in one point. Right? In that case, you're going to end up with exactly the picture like here. Right? So if we're going to put the, the if we're going to make the, the weights uh, to match the, the, the three-dimensional input, we need to apply our convolution function and get exactly the result. And, and fully connected layer, I, I've just shown you, you can do convolution on the weights of the same size and you get just the dot product. Right? So, in a way, all we're doing in the convolution neural network, surprisingly, is a convolution and nothing else. So I think I'll stop the, 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 the demo here. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, a bunch of things are still in the paper. The backward part, part is still in the paper. And um, um, I'll just begin to quickly move to the conclusions. Oh no, first uh, performance. So, okay, it's all very beautiful. Uh, ten lines of code, but well, performance is not that great. Um, so the TensorFlow is a reference point. Uh, and we ran training, which is basically the backward part that usually takes most of the time and the, the, the testing. Um, the funny part, you can see the TensorFlow takes six seconds to initialize on a pretty modern CPU. I don't know what the hell they're doing, but you can reduce the, the, the complexity of the framework, you know, they have to six seconds, right? That's, I don't understand. Um, you can see that it takes, it takes an order of magnitude uh, uh, more time to do the entire training and recognition in APL. Uh, due to because it's it's an interpreter and uh, the, the, the jitting support is not that great seemingly and the, the parallelism support is not that great either in this particular interpreter maybe there are others but this is kind of box standard. Now we try to implement the same algorithm in SAC. Uh, it is a it is a compiler for array languages and you can see we're doing much better and actually outperforming TensorFlow. That's not the point I'm not trying to sell you SAC. I'm trying to tell you that. If we switch to language, to an array language with a compiler, we can do very good. Right? And the conclusion that I made from, from this is that, well, array languages ideally suit to embed uh, machine learning DSLs. And we should do this, all of you who are interested in the uh, 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 array optimizations and array languages as said. As for APL, I think it's a fantastically expressible. We want to have such level of expressibility given that we can bring it to uh, the efficient code. Right? Um, what is missing? Well, we need to figure out which compiler is, is best suited, including the fact that a lot of people currently are interested in running their machine learnings on accelerators, GPUs, FPGAs, TPUs, uh, and that's basically the standard expectations from the ML community. And uh, uh, because of power, because of parallelism, for many reasons, so uh, we want to do this. GPU support is usually good, the others, well, we have to see. Automatic differentiation would be a very uh, uh, good to have, because if we do that, then basically the, uh, the, the back part that I didn't show you is all about uh, uh, gradient descent, so it's differentiation, so if we, if we have uh, support for the automatic differentiation in the language, we can construct pretty much the backward part automatically. That would be very nice, and not a lot of array languages do this because, well, it's pretty boring, but it would be very practical here. And the final thing, no matter what you think about machine learning as such, uh, whether you like it or not, I think it is a fantastic opportunity to sell array technology to the alpha world. I think we should all jump on this example because it's, I think it's still not too late. So, with that, I think I conclude. Thanks very much. The implementation is all available at uh, GitHub, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, time for questions. Would the next speaker like to start setting up while we're doing this? More questions? Yes. Um, the uh, performance numbers and comparisons. Uh, was that single core? Yes, that single core because, because APL couldn't do uh, a multi core, which, which is a problem, but, but you know, others, others can do multi core. And other array languages can do multi core, just the APL is not very good. Other questions? Can I, can I suggest 
suggest that it's there for optimizing a range of computations. Uh, you, you probably suffer from the fact that ABL is, is untyped and uh, the sort of compiler needs to, to figure out the print uh, on the edge of the representation that way. I would, I would definitely agree in principle. I don't think that's where ABL suffers from. I think, I think it, 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 it has a lot of assumptions about interactivity of the program, right? Yes. For instance, that you know, a, a user could, could, could push uh, stop while the program executes, change something, and push restart. Right? That's something we never think about in the uh, uh, compiled languages. Right? We don't have any state in, in our pure function language with, with the rates. Right? So is that an APL thing? Or yeah, that's an, a, that's an APL thing. Well, I mean, for, for most of the systems that are out there, they, it is an assumption that it has to be very interactive. But for certain aspects, that's why you can't really, in general at least, uh, you know, uh, Optimize it to the level that you like. So, so these kinds of these kinds of problems are uh, stand on the way of. of uh, okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Justin. For my sort of following up. Mm -hmm. on <coughs> Try doing this in J also. No, no, that that, that, was, was, that would probably directly answer the tag checking questions. Since you only do it once per array. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, it's it's a good idea. A lot of things that can be tried out. It's it's just a small experiment that that, that you know we had to do to start somewhere.